When I look at U.S. inflation, the thing I don't think most of the partners realize is that this inflation is really tame compared to previous inflation rates we saw back in 1970 and 1980. The big inflation push in the 1970s and 80s was, of course, energy. Energy went very, very crazy in the 1970s with the oil embargo. And if you start to think about what's happening with Russia, what's happening with Iran, what's happening with uh, China, we have a lot of political tension out there right now. We actually have a war going on. As a result, it's disrupting global supply of oil and natural gas. It's putting a lot of pressure on those that are not involved in that kind of geopolitical mess. And so as a result, when you look at the 12 years from about 1970 to 1982, we had a, a continual uptick in inflation. It cooled off about the late 1970s and then skyrocketed again. Why? Because the feds pulled back too fast on the rate of interest they charged. They didn't cool the economy. They got pressure politically. So they started putting higher interest rates. They pulled down the demand. They let off the throttle and it just skyrocketed even higher right after they did that. I do not, for one, believe that they're going to stay with the path necessary to get this inflation under control. Now, the backside of inflation is those red lines that are negative, which means after the recession, after the inflation period, you have a period of recession. Now, I was a kid during this time, but the, the reality of it is we're in the same kind of position today as I think they were in the 1970s and 80s. In other words, we have a dysfunctional Fed. We have a, a poor leadership in the White House. We have still remaining robust demand. People still have cash. They're spending it. They're borrowing their credit card. And interest rates are still not so intolerable that they won't go out and borrow money to do certain things like buy cars and RVs and, and et cetera. So even though the majority of Americans out there are really feeling the effects of inflation, for the upper class, the, the high middle class, the upper class, they're still spending as if there's no tomorrow because they don't believe, because they've never seen what inflation can really do. This was a 12-year period of time, and it was not done by anything but energy, be realistic. And of course, the Fed's uh, inability to stay the course that needs to be taken. In my opinion, the, the Fed needs to keep raising fund rates until we get the economy completely cooled off because inflation is a tough, tough beast to overcome financially for your portfolio and, of course, with the investments that you make. Uh, then let's talk about stalemate. Stalemate looks like what? Stalemate is a locked up administration. If the conservatives take over by winning broadly tomorrow, if there's a red wave like everybody's discussing there is, well, that means a great thing. Because why? Because once you have the White House at odds or polar opposite of both the House and the Senate, you now have kind of a stalemate. That's a good thing for investors. At least they know nothing radical can be done. The problem with that is, is that we have nothing to combat inflation. In other words, whatever Congress tries to pass, Biden will veto. Whatever Biden tries to do, the House will not pass. So this impasse means we're stuck with what we get as of tomorrow. And that means we're probably going to see continuation of runaway inflation. We're going to probably see a continuation of rising commodity prices. We're going to see a continuing rising cost of debt. And we're going to see very, very little in the way of solutions. Uh, the good news is you'll probably have the same tax scenario as you have after tomorrow going forward for the next two years because they won't get anything passed or it'll be rejected or vetoed or, or voted down. Um, there's nothing that's going to take place that's going to encourage expiration. In other words, whatever the House and Senate tries to do, Biden will veto. Whatever Biden tries to do detrimentally on gas industry, the House and Senate will override it. There's nothing to scare the oil and gas sector, though. So whatever rules are in the rule book as of tomorrow, uh, then that's what they're going to play by, which tells me they're probably going to stick with only drilling out of cash flow. They're not going to have any basic reasons to go out beyond their current cash flow and take any additional risk on it. Um, um, commodities will move substantially higher once the supply train derailment sinks in. In other words, now that we have this month of November and OPEC decrease and SPR barrels gone and Russia down, you'll start seeing the effects of that as early as December and really exponentially in the first half of next year. And we can see some unbelievably strong commodity prices, both in oil, natural gas liquids and natural gas. So this is kind of a possible recession. I heard this from a guy about uh, two months ago, and he explained it very well. So I'm going to kind of try to take from his his information. But basically, he said, look, this is going to be a different recession than we've had before. Instead of just dropping off a cliff because of the housing bubble in 2008, this was not going to be just like falling off a cliff in the Grand Canyon. This is going to be a possible. And the possible simply means we started about uh, nine months ago. We've been in recession. And it was slow. And it started coming. It started building speeds. It got to the rim or the edge of the bowl itself. And it kind of smoothed out. So the Fed and investors felt like it was over. And then the real recession kicks in because that was a false pretense to an early end of the recession that was not real. And so what will happen is, is that too many of you will get 
involved in buying back in the stocks and other investments because you think recession is over. And so I'm telling you that this recession, from my view, pretty much paralleling what this individual said, is that this is probably a possible. This is going to be a nice recession going down. It's not going to be a cliff. Um, it's going to be slow for recovery. Early investors that jump in now are going to get hammered because you're going to think this is a good real estate deal compared to what it was last year. This is a good uh, multifamily, good self-storage, et cetera, because you think it's kind of at the end, the feds are going to pull back on their interest rate. I want to remind you what the interest rate chart showed back in the 1970s. When you pull back too early, you cause skyrocketing inflation on the backside. So for me, I'm looking at this possible as a visual saying, okay, we're only nine months into the rim, which is probably 24 month period of time. That rim represents 24 months in my mind. After 24 months, we see the real dip in recession, which will probably come in the middle to latter part of 2024 and maybe in the first part of 2025. The new president that takes over in 2024 is going to have a real hell of a hard time trying to balance interest rates, inflation, recession, consumer demand, et cetera. So I think whoever jumps in early now is probably making a fatal mistake. I think patience is going to win the day. I think there's chaos in old investments will become more relevant. And what I mean by that is there's things you invested in last year, the year before 20, 2019, 2020, 2021, you invested in. And the whole mantra or the physical model at that time was to buy it, hold it, improve it, flip it, use low interest rates to get out of it, try to use low cap rates to justify a higher price per value. I think those cap rates are gone. I think those lenders are gone. I think those low interest rates are gone. So you've got to start looking at what you invested in previously. Start recognizing some of those are not going to be able to exit. You're going to be holding on to them a lot longer. Some of them are going to receive less than that operating income as uh, lower income tenants become more acutely aware of, hey, I got to move to a cheaper place to live. There's going to be a lot of transition. That's the deep part of the bowl. That deep part of the bowl is what's going to take place in the real estate market, how that's going to be affected, how the residential market is going to dry up, how there's going to be a lot of tough, tough uh, sponsor conversation with their investor about, hey, I told you I could get out with cheaper interest rates. I can't. That's all coming. So chaos and old investments are going to start raising their head. And I just want everybody to know that I think we're in this for the long haul. This is not going to be a short term two or three year recession. I think this recession could be as much as four to seven years. And it's going to be something we're going to be dealing with until we get a very strong physical policy, which we do not have now. So what's my conclusion? Invest in what does not require debt to make numbers work. If somebody show me an investment is talking about an exit or low cap rate or low interest rate cap out to get out of it, I'm not interested. I am seeing more BS in pitches on real estate and other investment classes that just don't make any sense. I'm seeing a whole lot of new oil and gas sponsors because they know that investors are running to oil and gas for tax write-offs. And what they do is they run so fast, they leave their brain and common sense behind them. But I'm seeing real estate investments across the board on my feed coming in at 15 to 25 percent internal rates of return over the next three to five years. I do not have a clue how they're going to get that, how they're going to achieve that. I have no clue. Remember, the higher the rate of return, the higher the risk. The higher the rate of return means there's probably more fluff or they've changed their model. You need to be very careful. Your exits must be realistic based upon the market's ability to acquire the asset, not financing. In other words, can you buy a truly class B residential and turn it into a class A by adding better tenants and increasing your rates, et cetera. Don't look at the refinancing as a way to get out. I think you should be very, very cautious when you're looking at these financial models and make sure they make common sense in today's market in the transition that I believe is taking place over the next 24 to 48 months, which is a much deeper recession with much higher interest rates as the feds try to figure out how hard they have to push without completely collapsing the uh, financial markets. Invest in what is not negatively affected by rising energy. So one of the things that's going to be hurting us is as they try to use the Fed fund rate to get people to stop borrowing money and spending money, one thing that they're not talking a lot about is the rising energy rate. So rising energy is really what crippled the 1970s and early 80s because oil and gas got so expensive, it affected everybody's bottom line. So you need to think about, if I invest in this, how does rising energy affect their bottom line and their net operating income? How, how financially solvent is that financial model when you say maybe energy prices are up 15, 20, 30 percent over the next 24 to 36 months? You'd be surprised how many models absolutely fall apart when you start factoring in rising energy, everything from labor cost, fuel, electricity, landscaping, whole nine yards. All right. So here's my warning. And it's just a simple blank page because this is the way it works. I know many of you are really, really love and train to not be liquid. You want to be fully vested. And that's smart. I know there's an inflation rate out there that's probably true at about 15%. 
But the warning I'm giving you is as follows. From a guy who's been doing this for going on 38 years, you're going to find yourself running straight into the wolf's teeth, the wolf's mouth. You're going to invest in things that you shouldn't be investing in. You're going to listen to nice country twangs pitching on real estate or oil and gas or self-storage or whatever. And the truth of the matter is right now, all these sponsors are watching their incomes disappear. They're watching their cash flow disappear. So what they're doing is they're raising the interest rate. They're, they're putting more honey on the bait to draw you in. And I'm just going to tell you as my friends, as my partners, this is the time to be overly cautious. So don't invest with newcomers to the market in the last five years. Don't invest really with people who didn't live through 2008 because they have no clue what to do on the backside. There's already real estate scams coming out of the woodwork. Hard money loans didn't exist. There was no assets behind it. Real estate projects where money was not properly allocated. It's going to be continuous. Don't be surprised for it. You don't know what's going to happen to your own portfolio because you don't know which one of those sponsors didn't do things right, either strictly because they were negligent or because it was intentional. But when the market's cool and the Ferris wheel stops is when the reality comes true. So just be, be warned. I'd be asking about my old investments and I sure wouldn't be jumping into new investments until I was 100% sure who the sponsor was, how the numbers work, and why all of a sudden did their numbers get at least 50 to 100% higher than they were six or 12 months ago? Is that only a way to tri trick you into investing because you need those high numbers to stop being in a cautious, passive position?